God, our Father, we thank you so much as you bring your word through your servant whom you have prepared. Set apart for this day, Lord. We pray that as she ministers your word, teach us the humility of Christ. So, Lord, we are open to teach us, to rebuke us, so that our hearts and our mind, Lord, will be aligned. And, Lord, if you come even in this service, make us ready to receive you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To pick us my coffee. I'm really glad to be here and I want to thank Pastor Iggy and the team for being sensitive to get a podium that is not taller than me. <laughs> I really struggle because sometimes I can't see above the other podiums very well. And when I was growing up, it just reminded me that uh, when I was in primary school, they used to call me Little Lucy because I was the smallest in my class all the years. Then I went to high school and they called me Small Lucy because everyone was getting taller and I was staying the same. By the time I went to university, they called me Micro because now surely. <laughs> and so if you're ever in town and hear anyone shout my name Micro, you know which season they were in and quite a few of them still call me that. But what was amazing, even as I reflect on that story, is that um, I actually thought I was too small not only in size, but also in capacity to do anything that others were doing. And um, it took the Lord really to show me that you come to him as you are. It doesn't matter the limitations you have. You know, here I was, I'm going to university, I'm 19. Everyone has a boyfriend, no one has ever talked to me because they probably think I am, I don't know, someone's baby sister. Now the worst part, so my name is Lucy Warwenge. I met my husband, Peter, in university and we got married about um, eight years after we graduated. But I now learned just before we got married that when I walked into the university class in Chiromo, they have a sort of auditorium and I was doing maths and statistics. There were like 200 guys. And so the few girls who don't want to be bullied, you know, we sit in front. And when I walked in and sat there, apparently the guys at the back thought the lecturer had come with his daughter. And then they wondered why this girl is not leaving because that lecturer left and the next one came. Anyway, he only confessed that after I married him. If I had known. <laughs> but the Lord takes us as we are and does great things we, 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 with us in the way he has made us. So I want to encourage you all as young people because I know young people go through a lot of struggles of figuring out, am I good enough? Am I going to become? Am I accepted enough? Um, and some of what we learn today is really what Christ expects is a humble and contrite heart. And God will use you in more ways than you can imagine. So as we look at Philippians, which is the book we are now looking at here at the cathedral, remembering our theme for the year is Be Ye Transformed. And as we began looking at Philippians in the last couple of weeks, we've gone from looking at... Um, Paul, uh, Paul writing to the Philippians and thanking them for their generosity and care over him. And then he challenges them that the gospel must be advanced no matter what, whether people are preaching for, for personal gain or not. The key thing is that the gospel is advanced. And um, last week, I, uh, we, I believe we looked at what it means to live a life worthy of the Lord. And today we want to look at Christ's example of humility. This second chapter of Philippine, Philippians, not Philippines, is the best chapter for me in the Bible. It's a verse, verses I have read over and over, verses I have memorized because of the power that is there in understanding what God is saying through Paul, through this example of Christ in humility. And I wanted to reflect today on, before we even go into the passage, when you try and think about an analogy of important, powerful, influential people, and you take an example of a king, and there was a time in the, in the TV, there used to be a program, My Day With You, and they'll look at maybe a doctor, and they'll find a doctor and go through what does a doctor's day look like, a famous doctor, or My Day With You, and they'll talk to an engineer. Imagine if you were looking at a show on My Day With You in the life of a king or a president. What comes to mind? What comes to mind when you think about the, my day with you as a king or a president? I'm sure it is 
carpets and comfortable seats and five course meals and chefs and people waiting on you and your clothes always clean, always proper, always ironed. You think of all the things they enjoy because of things people do for them, isn't it? Now, if you were to think of my day with you as a life of a servant, it's normally not the kind of life you will admire. You may be intrigued to see it, but it probably won't be the life you're looking to be. Because the life of a servant, I imagine on a daily, on a daily is what? It is scrubbing, it is washing, it is cleaning up after all the important people have done what they need to do, whether it's eating or using a space. It is being in the background, it's never being visible, right? Even when you go to a restaurant or a good, you know, go for a good meal, you hardly get to see who's in the kitchen and what goes on in the peeling of potatoes and the cooking. And so the world gives us an image that importance comes with what's pompous and what's visible and what people give as accolades. So yesterday, I went online to look at what does the world focus on when it's trying to think of an important person? And I just went to Google and I said, who are the most important people in our time? No, most famous was the first word I searched. Can you guess who came up? Are you? Iggy. Um, maybe number 900 and... <laughs> just kidding. Number one, Cristiano Ronaldo. I was surprised. With 700 and... Okay, let me stop. How many of you have a social media account? Or maybe I should ask how many don't, because I think this is the Gen Z stage. Everyone does, right? Okay, how many of you have more than 100 followers? Yeah, you guys are doing okay. So listen to this. Cristiano Ronaldo, 733 million followers. Lionel Messi, 500 million followers. Then Elon Musk, then Oprah Winfrey, Dwayne Johnson, and then I stopped. Then I thought, let me ask, I'm, I'm trying to think, what are they looking for? How do they define these important people? And I said, let me think, of, let me ask about who are the leading influencers today? And a lot of those same names came up. And it's really around their profession or around their worth in cash, isn't it? It's really largely around that. But then I thought, if I want to look at across time, so I asked a different question. I said, who are the 100 most influential persons in history? And number one was Mohammed. Number two, again, this is a study by one particular person, so it doesn't mean it's a status for everyone, but he's one of the guys who's been studying this. Number two was Isaac Newton. What did Isaac Newton invent? Oh, he, he was able to help us understand gravity, right? He didn't invent it, but he helped us understand it. Number three was Jesus Christ. And number four was uh, Buddha, and number five was Confucius. So again, they were look, but here then they were not looking at wealth, they were looking at influence. People, and not just influence in terms of followers, influence who have impact on how other people live. So not just what they have or what they get, but how other people live for society, for humanity. And so we come to this passage just in that backdrop of how the world defines importance and relevance. And we find that uh, Philippians is talking to us, starting by saying, if we look at verse 1, and we can go to the second slide, the, the three outlines for the, the sermon today is we're going to look at humility as a key to unity. We're also going to look at humility, which is achieved through obedience, and we look at humility, which results in reward and exaltation. And why we want to look at juxtapose Christ against all these other people is to appreciate what God calls greatness, what God calls most influential, what God calls most impactful. So this is one of the most amazing, deeply profound passages that Paul has written. And he picks it up from where we left off last week in living a life worthy of the Lord. And he starts in verse 2. So we're going to look at unity as a, humility as a key to unity. He says, so, if there is any encouragement to Christ, any comfort from his love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord with one mind. So when he starts by so, it means he's connecting it with the previous passage. 
having taught us that we must advance the gospel, having challenged us that we must live a life that's worth living. He's then saying so. And the reason he's saying this, even as he challenges the church, is that the church in Philippi was beginning to have a bit of cracks. There was beginning to be division in the church of who's more important, of who's more uh, um, to, be, to, be, to be recognized. And you know, even in today's world, we really do like being recognized. And you'll see in Philippians 4, which we will not cover today, there are two people, Eudea and Syntyche, who were not getting along. And they were the church, among the church prominent leaders at that time. So Paul was beginning to see, if there's going to be discord in the leadership, there's also going to be disunity in the membership. And he's saying, so, for you to live this life that we have said, if you have been encouraged by being parts of Christ's body, if there's any way that you have participated in his love and his spirit, is that if there's been any affection among yourselves, then make, he says, make my joy complete. And he says, how? By being of one mind, by having the same love, and by being in full accord together. So Paul is challenging them to be people who think as one, not think uniformly, but who are committed to the same thought patterns. As we sit here in the youth ministry, in this service, some of us here are leaders, whether ushers or singers, or uh, helping with the rotaring of what's happening where. Are we working together with one mind that is of Christ? That our oneness is based on Christ, not on the differences between us. He's also saying that they should be of one accord, having the same love. Do we discriminate on how we support each other? Do we say I support the people who are more with Pastor Igi and not Pastor Ampella? Do we discriminate a ministry group because of things they do you don't think are as important to you as what you do? He's saying you need to have the same love. And this is not only in church, even though he was addressing the people in this uh, church of Philippi, it's also in society. It's in your family. It's in your workplace. Are you able to say that you do not discriminate? That you're seeking to have the same mind with those who you are of one purpose? But more so, when people are believers in Christ, it is expected that we will take the effort to be of oneness in how we think and in the things that we pursue together. So this was the challenge that Paul was putting to them. And he then says in verse 3, which is, I think, the most important verse in this passage, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's not easy, to think about others as more important than you. Maybe you're the president of your school club. Maybe you're the leader in your organizational department. Maybe you're the firstborn in your family. But Paul is saying, do not think about what serves you. Do not think about what's best for you. Think about others as more important than yourself. And this is the first key principle of humility, that you think about others as more important than yourself. And then in verse 4, he says, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is what the example that Christ was showing us. And how did Christ do this? Christ, who was God, did not consider equality with God as something to boast about. So remember the analogy we thought about a king and how a day with a king looks like? It's like someone who knows I'm a king, but I'm willing to have my day look like the day of a servant. So before we move to the next section, in that section of verse 1 to verse 4, we are being challenged to do nothing out of selfishness. Do not be out to show your fame. Do not be out to show yourself better than others. Do not be out to get others to treat you as more important than they. But in humility, count others more significant than you. And here I'd want us to reflect. In what ways can I practically count others more important than me? Are there people who are more lower than me but whom I'm willing to serve? Is there a job that no one wants to do because it's mundane, it's back door, no one will notice, no one will give me a like, no one will even recognize? Am I willing to take on that task and support someone else who needs that help? What are the interests of others that I can think about today? Is there an opportunity for a position 
and we are several of us in that department, not so much a position for promotion, but maybe an event to attend a meeting or to attend a conference, and there aren't enough spaces for everyone, am I willing to think this person deserves it more than me? Or I know I might get another chance, but this person may, might not. Let me give them this opportunity. Are we willing to think through how can we take that role that is lowly for the sake of others? This is the spirit with which Paul is telling the church and in this morning to, to ourselves that we be people who are willing to think of others. And that will build unity in any community. If you think of others before yourself, if it's among your siblings or among your neighbors, it will bring unity among yourselves. Now let's go to the second section, which is verse 5 to verse 8. And here we are going to really look at how Christ exhibited humility, which is achieved through obedience. And I'm going to highlight a few parts of that verse. It says, have this mind among yourselves. And it now outlines who Christ was. He was in very nature God. Remember when he was born as man of the Virgin Mary, he was born by decree of God through the Holy Spirit. So he was God. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So Jesus coming as the word of God was God. But he's born in a nonchalant place in a manger, not a big hospital, not a known name, no insurance cover. That's how he comes into the world. But more importantly, at the age of 30, when he starts his ministry, even before he starts, we see that he walks a life of obedience. Number one, he did not go around saying, hi guys, you know I'm God. You know the father up there is my father. Which is what we would like to do if we, are, we were related. If the president was your father, or if an important CEO was your uncle, or if the provost was your kid brother or your older brother, you'd want that noted. As you introduce yourself, you'll be putting in a word here and there. You know, my name is Lucy, but you know, the provost's uncle's brother is my neighbor. You know, you're really trying to force that linkage because you want to show I know people. Or you know, the archbishop where he comes from, his wife, where she went to school, my kid's sister's neighbor was in the class, same class with her. We like being associated with important people and we just have to watch when people are around important people, how they behave. When Obama came to Kenya, people scuttling to be on a list to be where he will be. I've been in a few uh, national occasions and the meeting, a room like this is very nice and casual until the president walks in. My goodness, you're shoved and you find yourself uko inje. You had a seat, but you have no clue what happens because we all want to be close to power. We think it's going to rub off. It's going to get us to a pedestal. What was amazing is that Jesus did none of that. In fact, it was John during the baptism who says, behold the son of God, right? He never associated the fact that he didn't use the fact that he was associated with God the Father as a way to get himself elevated. He did not feel entitled. He did not feel that he deserved any special treatment. But more so, he emptied himself and walked this journey and obeyed God in every part. Being a servant, and I think for me the most vivid example of Jesus being a servant is when he washed his disciples' feet. That here he was, having walked with them as his disciples, he's their boss, he's their leader, and then he says, let me wash your feet. And I know when the cathedral started doing that, the very first time on a Monday Thursday, when the clergy removed their robes, and they sat there with buckets and washed our feet. Wasn't that humbling? You're thinking, how? And then we all washed each other's feet. That, in a sense, did a lot to, at least for me, to remind me that I am here to serve anyone. People I know, people I don't know, God calls us to serve. That was a very humbling experience for me. But to imagine that Christ, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, then sits and says, do as I do, by washing the disciples' feet, uh, showing us what servanthood was. He was in every way man. He felt our pain. He felt our sorrow when he grieved the loss of his friend Lazarus. He felt hunger when he fasted for 40 days. And yet he humbled himself and became obedient even to death and death on the cross. 
And I'd like us to stay in that for a few minutes. If you are the son of God, if you are all able, and Satan knew he's all able, because Satan said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself before me and bow before me. He knew that this was God, and that's why he wanted God to, to worship him. And of course, Jesus did not. Jesus chose to then die on the cross. So it's not just a sacrifice of, I'll wash your feet. It's not just a sacrifice of, oh yeah, just go and take the front seat instead of me. He then said, he who was sinless said, Father, not your will, not my will, but your will. Knowing this was going to be the most painful thing anyone can do for anyone, to die for them. We love our children. We love our parents. But I don't know. At that split moment, if you're told to die for them, you may say you will, but I'm sure in your heart you're struggling, like, must I really die on behalf of someone else? But what was even more amazing is the type of death he died. He didn't just die in a secluded place, like an, uh, an electric shock taken through him or a gas chamber. He had nails pierced through him and put on a cross and placed in a public place. The humiliation that must have come with that. That here I am, I'm God, I've chosen to die. But in the manner in which I'm dying, I'm going to be abused, I'm going to be humiliated, I'm going to be exposed. It's not lost to us that by the time Christ says it is finished and he's left on the cross, everyone leaves. He's also abandoned, not only by everyone who's there, but even in the three days in, his hell, in hell, he's not even with his father. Can you think of what kind of humility that is? That you're willing to obey in obedience, in walking with what Christ calls you to do for the sake of Christ. This is what Paul is asking us to grasp. That indeed, if you're going to be of one mind and one spirit of, and one love, now take on the nature of Jesus who humbled himself and, and died even death on the cross. The opposite of humility is pride. Pride is when we think of ourselves first. Pride is when we think of impressing others. Pride is when we think we know all. Here is what the Bible says about pride. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 16, 5 says, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. The Bible also says in Proverbs 16, 8, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. There's enough warning of the consequences of pride. And if we go to the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, Satan is tempting Adam and Eve, and he says to Eve, Did God surely say that you should not eat of that fruit? Really? What God did not tell you is that if you eat of it, you will become as wise as him, and you will become like him. Again, going back to the sense of our humanness, we try to elevate ourselves. This is the opportunity Satan was giving Adam and Eve. You can be like God. Perhaps they can even imagine they can be like, they can be God. And that's the temptation of our lives today. We want to be greater by getting attention to ourselves. We want to amass more by owning more than everyone else. We want to be in the highest position so that we can have servants behind us to tell and telling them what to do. We want to pursue all the pleasures of life, no matter what it costs. And these things, the pride of life, the desire of the things of these lives are the things that destroy us. They were the things Satan brought to Adam and Eve so that they would have what they desire with their eyes, so that they would more, be better and more knowledgeable than God, it is the things Satan puts to us today. Pride, possession, and passion. He wants to give us things to make us higher than others, so that we can be proud and be the best people that are known everywhere. He wants to give us this lust of desiring everything. Passion for things, for people, passion for positions. Satan wants to lure us to try and become bigger than God 
or become wiser than God. And in small ways, if we're not careful, that's what can happen. When you're famous and you're known and you have followers, isn't it possible that pride can creep in, right? And there's nothing wrong with people following you for the good you do. There's nothing wrong for you knowing, being an expert in something and others learning from you through the social spaces we have. But you have to be careful to know, is that making me proud because I'm trying to now be the best me? Or am I willing to say, God, I'm doing the best I can. I'm being the best me for your glory, for your name, and for your fame. That's what is not easy. And as we come to the third point on humility in the end is exalted, we look at what happened to Christ. Out of that humility, God says, therefore, God exalted him and bestowed him his name above every other name. Praise the Lord. That Jesus, after humbling himself, was exalted above every other name. So you and I know today that Jesus' name is above Muhammad's, is above Buddha's, is above Isaac Newton, is above anyone past, present, or in the future. Because God exalted him because of his humility and because of his obedience. And what does God say to us today? Let's read James chapter 4 verse 10. Humble yourself therefore before the Lord and he will lift you up. You don't get lifted by trying to pull yourself up, by trying to push yourself forward, by trying to edge people out. The Bible says, humble yourselves and God will lift you up. And Luke 14, 11 says, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is what God has called us to, to seek the exaltation, not from our own doing, but from being exalted by Christ. And as we come to the end and reflect on these three, three key messages and reflect on Christ, Paul is saying that his joy will be complete, not when we demand to have what we deserve, not when we insist on amassing things for ourselves, not when we want to be the biggest position than everyone else, but when we look at the way of Christ and we walk in humility because then God will exalt us. God will lift you up in the place that he has placed you. God will lift you up in the place that he has called you. God will use you to glorify his name, but in doing so, he will also lift you up. And so here are the key lessons, the three final lessons for us this morning. That Jesus is the example for us. We can go to the last slide. The, second, the next slide, please. Jesus is the example for us and is calling us to humility. No, just go, yeah, just go back. Um, yes, all right, yeah. So we are called to have an attitude of humility, an attitude of self-sacrifice, and an attitude of servanthood. And we then look at the example of Jesus. Jesus gave himself up and was selfless. The next slide. Jesus also sacrificed himself for our sake. Jesus served without limitation and without expecting a reward. He didn't serve because others were watching to tell him, oh, well done. And I know it is good to appreciate people, but we need to be careful that we are not working for the appreciation or the applause. We are serving for the glorification of God's name. And so should we emulate the same, to serve as Jesus did, to sacrifice as Jesus did, to give up our privileges as Jesus did. But remember, none of us can ever sacrifice enough as Christ did, none of us can actually ever sacrifice and atone for our sins. That's the one thing only Christ can do. And if there's anyone here who has never accepted that call from God, when Jesus sacrificed himself, it wasn't just because God would exalt him, it was because he cared to cause each one of us to be his child. If there's anyone here who has never accepted the gift of Jesus Christ as his savior, you need to do that this morning because it is only with Christ in your heart that you can actually be as humble as he was. 
humanly saying it is not possible. We have the example of Adam and Eve. They failed. We have examples of Samson who became proud of his own strength and the passions of life misled him and he fell. We have an example of David when he was king and people were out fighting and he sees Bathsheba, again, the passions and the lust of life and he commits adultery. He fell. None of us can really walk humbly without Christ. So we need Christ to help us. So if you're not a believer, today Christ is inviting you because he humbled himself and died for you in a humiliating death that you would know him today. But if you're a believer, our prayer is that God would help us by the power of his Holy Spirit to take the symbol and example of Christ. To not consider others as better than ourselves, but in humility, not to consider ourselves as more important than others, but in humility to consider others better than ourselves and to consider the interests of others more than the interests of ourselves. And as we close, I'd like us to together say these two verses of Philippians chapter 3 verse 4, which I would like to charge us to also memorize because they're the essence of what Paul is telling us in that passage of Philippians chapter 2. Together, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And may God help us that if we are to really live a life that is worth living, if we are to really live in a manner that exemplifies the gospel, if we are to really stand fast for Christ in the spirit, that we would be like Christ, humbling ourselves, thinking of others before ourselves, but knowing that in doing so, God's name is glorified and we will be exalted. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that your word reminds us that in humility there is greatness. In humility there is unity. In humility there is obedience. Help us, Lord, to walk in obedience to you. For there is no other way. There is no other way that we can be who Christ showed us to be. So I commit those this morning who do not know you, that, Lord, you would quicken their hearts to make a decision to follow you this day. I pray for us who have been walking with you that you'd remind us that humility is key for us to be exalted by you, Lord Jesus. Forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, when we have put ourselves before others, sometimes even put ourselves before you and teach us that our greatness will only come as we humble ourselves before you. For I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.